to whom it may concern from Peter Bell date August 17th regarding Lynx Lake Labrador found a prospector named Cameron Martin who's got some good ground part of a group in Newfoundland and Labrador and one of his projects really jumped out at me he'd shared some pictures of some old drill core and there was some Twitter back and forth with Neil Blackmore grassroots prospecting and it led me to kind of go down a rabbit hole of figuring out what the history of that project was and what the possible merits of it are today because it seemed like a screaming opportunity just from the little bits of info I was able to gleam initially from his posts online. So I'll just kind of jump in and um, give my sense of things now. I've spent 90 minutes talking to Cameron and on Sunday night yesterday and then today spent a bunch of time talking to different geologists about the possible approach and I'll summarize my thoughts and what I've heard from Cameron here. So the story that Cameron tells starts with uh, him as a surveyor working in Voises Bay when they were finishing the pre-strip and he was uh, they were getting to expose some ore there and fast forward some years and he was working on another highway the Trans, Lab the Trans Labrador Highway and the crew blasted a pit to get some aggregate for um, building the road and Cameron said that when they blasted those quarries to on the side of the highway in the middle of nowhere in Labrador he saw some rocks that looked familiar uh, similar to stuff he'd seen at Voises Bay so you know he's not a trained geologist but Newfoundland's done a pretty good job of encouraging generations of prospectors and I trust their eye to some degree <laughs> particularly when you see the kind of rock as what <laughs> he's been able to find since then pretty clear something's going on so there's a good little twist of fate there for Cameron's side and there's also an interesting wrinkle in that story um, that the highway crew was blasting a pit on the side of the road. That's telling, okay? Because this is an area in Labrador where, you know, they've done regional geophysics, but they've never done any regional geochem, from what I can tell. At least not nearby. So there's not really any evidence of anything interesting out there. Uh, it's important to remember the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So that, you know, doesn't really tell us anything um, other than it's a real new area. And to think that a highway crew that blasts out a few tons of <laughs> rock um, could be, you know, in a way your advanced prospecting crew, they've done uh, a stripping program and some trenching almost in a way that really really important for exploration because they might have removed the cover and left you looking at you know fresh sulfides right the layer of oxidation might have been real shallow so that's important it's a bit technical maybe but just to point out that even from the initial story of how we got here there's a bunch of stuff that is serendipitous and uh, encouraging 
and it's often that way with prospectors, you know. Um, but this one struck me as particularly that way. Whereas some prospector stories are like, well, you know, there was a government program and they had a particularly hot number right around here, so we staked it. That can be a good story too, um, but it's not the same as this, because if this Cameron Martin guy hadn't been working on the crew on the highway that, you know, did this blasting and exposed these rocks... It could be that this area is entirely overlooked and not ever really seen as an area of great potential, which it is. And the justification for saying that is kind of a regional geological story. So if we step back a bit and look at the government geology maps, um, you're at a big fault here that runs a long ways and you're on the edge of a kind of notorious group of rocks that uh, extend a great ways and have in, in Quebec and such and have a reputation for being really tortured and um, cryptic and um, hosting deposit types that are unrecognizable in some ways that have been transformed or altered or you know not a geologist here myself so it's always a challenge to explain this but I have some familiarity with it in detail from um, the Kintovar story so that's a copper exploration play in the Granville in southern Quebec I'd say that is halfway between Val d'Or and Montreal and and it's a sediment-hosted copper, which is pretty normal. There's lots of those around the world. But it's been altered by things happening in the Grenville terrain that make it basically unrecognizable as a sediment-hosted copper. So that's really interesting, and it's it's been a good discovery story. They had like an 8% copper grab on surface that really lit the thing on fire and started the excitement there. Um, it's been an unusually successful copper exploration story, I would say, um, in terms of some of the funding that it's got from Quebec institutions. So, lots more to say about all that, but just to keep in mind that the base metals are the big leagues here, and gold, you know, may get a lot more attention and funding from, you know, investors in Vancouver, but copper's probably the more important market globally. And nickel, also very important. And cobalt. Talk about ethical sources of cobalt and stuff like that. And have to think about Labrador. And Voises Bay is now a significant source of cobalt, right? And there was a big transaction where they sold the revenue stream off to a uh, wheat and precious metals big royalty company that you know <laughs> went it they bet big on cobalt um a couple years ago now and it's moved against them so they look kind of you know silly they were they made their name on silver and there's a whole bunch of stories of why that was a good investment for them to buy buy up byproduct silver production streams around the world and aggregate them and get a bunch of silver exposure in a bear market and then ride it into a, bear, a bull market and that worked really well for them but that was a pure play on silver and now they're, they've are they grown so big that they had to deploy capital elsewhere and cobalt's one of the things that they picked up but they bought it kind of at the highs and across the cycle they'll probably be proved right because it's really sensitive commodity and I think a lot of the demand is price insensitive, so it's a critical, critical material, but um, supply side is big question marks, and demand is, you know, really strong and growing all the time. So, really interesting fundamental setups here on the commodities. This, um, this thing in Labrador, Lynx Lake, it's, it's a bit of a mix, it's a bit of a mix, or a mess, I should say. Um, there's 
the one area that I've seen that he had hot grabs was copper and cobalt. But then there's also nickel and cobalt. And there's other minerals off as well. So the setting is basically two pits um, that were blasted by the highway crews. And from what I understand, the selective grabs that he's done there show that they have different types of mineralization, like very different types. And I guess, you know, this is getting into the, the reason why I'm concerned with it and interested is, you know, how representative are those results? Are these areas really, you know, that different? Or did he just do really selective grabs in each area to typify this type and then to, you know, give another example of this other type, right? Those sampling methodologies are really, really important and they color the perception, right? And the name of the game in the minerals exploration business is to kind of pull the shades away from your eyes so that you can get a better perception of reality and what is in the rocks so as to understand if there's a potential for a wildly profitable mining operation at the at the project and so based on the initial grabs that are showing high grade material i have to think that that's a possibility now the big question will be size and scale um, because continuity of geological systems in these places in newfoundland is notoriously fickle and you can get high grade but it can be really potty and you know you can find a lump of it here but good luck finding another one right so without that scale you don't really have a justification to build out a big project um, with the mill and all the associated facilities that go along with this stuff. And that leads me to this kind of basic intuitive idea I have for this scenario that the way forward is to pitch it as, you know, high grade open pit mine where you're collecting a feed uh, uh, material that can be sent to somebody who's operating a mill and be used to blend into their mill feed and increase their average grades. That's really the name of the game to justify, you know, this as a development scenario, right? And when you start out with these exploration stories, you have to know where it's going in the end. You have to be able to look at it and say, there's a mine there, you know, without blushing. <laughs> And the side of the road, you know, maybe you got to move the highway a little bit. That could be a problem, but not, not a deal breaker necessarily. And there's probably enough strike away from the highway too that you could put your pit there and not worry about it. Um, but are you going to build a mill in the middle of nowhere out there? Mm, probably not. They're talking about running a power line out there, but that's maybe years away. So I don't want to be pitching one of those stories. There's enough of those in the market. I want to be pitching something that is fast and meaningful to somebody with deep pockets. And nobody has deeper pockets than, you know, the big mining companies, right? So they would look at a small pit like this almost as a joke. And it would be somewhat unconventional for them to even do anything with it. Um, but if we can show that the metallurgy is favorable and that there's, you know, enough scale for us to be able to deliver material in some quantity with some consistency, that potentially is a win, right? And it's a potentially quick win where we get it up and running and then it's a going concern and then it becomes something that they want to buy. So there's lots of questions on that, which mill it would go to. <laughs> and to wit, I don't even know if that would be a copper story or a nickel story at this point, right? So that's good in my mind because it means there's more to play for. 
and maybe maybe there's potential to have both you know um, that starts to get a bit complicated but I'd rather have a couple options of things that could work at this early stage than to have it all hanging on one uh, Hail Mary scenario you know so that's kind of the end game and then the question is like how do you get there and how do you get there in a way that we can undertake you know the initial steps now that are you know fundable um, and implementable right so I don't want to have to worry about oh we got to permit this pro drill program and then by the time the permits come back the snow is going to be down and then we're going to be collaring and two feet we can't see you know that's not that's not what this is going to be because right now I'm talking about doing it on a shoestring budget privately so there's a lot to talk about there in terms of deal structure and stuff too um, I've floated around a few ideas about this before and I haven't really seen too many other good examples of what this might look like so I'll punt that discussion off for a little bit and there's another big unknown for me which is the budgeting uh, I start to have a bit of sense of numbers from the prospector about what work programs would cost him to do but the big one is probably going to be the lab work and you know if we spend 80 percent on lab testing i think that's just great most stories they wouldn't do that because they say oh, it's too much lab work but with base metals recovery is everything right so spending on that lab testing early is really important and i found out that something called a scoping study which would take like 10 or 20 kilograms of material and start to give you a sense for what the flow sheet would look like based on that rock so that's really cool and that kind of throws me off because i was thinking oh we'd ship 500 500 kilograms or you know two tons or something like this out to the lab and they'd process the whole damn thing and tell us how much you know grade it had across a large amount of material like that and that is probably asking too much at the first stage that's like a pilot plant stage and you kind of have to have your flow sheet hammered out to some degree before you do that so there's a whole bunch of conversation we can have around well maybe we do the blasting and the mucking to stack up and before the snow falls so that we have a stockpile a testing stockpile of five tons just sitting there and then we ship off and do this first round of testing and then the snow falls and then we come back and then we can grab more rock if we need to in january and we don't have to worry about you know doing real field work but we can at least grab some from our stockpiled testing inventory, right? So that's an idea I'm kind of batting around and even just saying it now, I like the way it sounds a little bit more too, right? And so basically the purpose of this whole note here is for me to flesh out some of the options and the ideas and things that other people have said and stuff that it makes sense to me intuitively, stuff I'd like to, to see done in terms of news flow, right? Um, everything in my mind here is predicated on generating news. Um, even as a private company, we, you know, we're not held to the same standards of QA, QC, but the news is everything. And the information that we generate from the work is, is everything. So how do we do that in a rigorous way that moves the ball down the field as far as possible, as quickly as possible, right? And it's easy to say, oh, we just do a bulk sample, but it's like, well, what does that mean? What does that mean when you have basically no information about the exposure that you're dealing with, 
right? Because the only geochem assays that we have are, I think, XRF readings on grabs, which is just very unreliable. You know, the XRFs are tricky and sensitive and, you know, I don't even think they were XRFing like blended crushed material. I think they were just XRF scanning a whole rock. So you could have just caught a face that had a bunch of crystals on it and is not representative in some way or, you know, and the grab, the grab you took in the first place could have been not representative. So there's enough reasons out there for smart people to say that this is no good and there's not it's not worth spending any money here but i know from seeing the pictures and talking to the guy that there is potential to find legitimate you know copper and nickel and more at this site so it's a question of how do you go about doing that and that's that's this whole topic so the simplest thing might be what warwick anderson um, from australia said to me on twitter which was basically just do a whole bunch of geochem work <laughs> you know he's he loves his geochem there's no doubt about it and he's really good for understanding how powerful an xrf analyzer can be for generating really quick information in the field and being able to, you know, ask, get assay, get, get geochem information on rock samples that the night that you sample, the day you sample them, you know, the day you cut them out and then, and the turnaround times on that are really useful for making your field work, you know, really flexible and dynamic. So he's not wrong about that, but I, we're not at a point where we're going to be investing in an XRF machine for this prospecting crew. Maybe next year. Maybe next year we have a 50-day field program, you know, with a real crew out there. And this guy, this prospector, he would be able to supervise them um, in some ways. There's no doubt because he knows the ground. He was just out there at the lake <laughs> um, for his holiday weekend, right? So he's really out there. He's really living out there. He's been going to this project for 10 years because it's been haunting him because he saw it and he caught, you know, copper fever or whatever it might be. So he knows what could be down there and he's not willing to let it go because finding something like this is very unusual. But where do you start, right? To date, he's been using the prospector grants, which is money from the Newfoundland government. Um, they give a certain amount, maybe five or ten grand a year. And he's been using that to cover lab costs, assay costs for a bunch of samples. But, you know, that, sam that assay spending gets spread over a couple projects. And how he chooses to do the field work that corresponds to those sampling results is kind of at his own whim, right? And maybe it's more disciplined or maybe it's less. Um, you know, it's certainly not public market standard level work. So that kind of puts us on the back foot in terms of trying to get this ready for the markets. And so that's what kind of led me to say bulk sampling because that's kind of like an undeniable result right if you say hey we ran 10 tons of something and it created this you know people generally shut up after that you know the they'll still say oh it was selective you know the predium and bruce jack in british columbia they say that is selective you know that's but that's years ago but still people still say it. it's it's you know there's always detractors and you can't completely shut them up but you have to plan your work so that they don't have the upper hand in the narrative around your exploration story so that's kind of been my driving thought is like how do we get more material tested from you know a specific location right but the blinders that I have on for that probably has made me overlook the need to do more comprehensive stuff around the area 
too. And that's one thing that I took from Warwick's comments, which is like, just, just sample all kinds of stuff. You know, don't be afraid to send dead rock in, right? If you're not sending dead rock in, you're not sampling broadly enough, right? That's, that's true in drilling. If you're not drilling dead holes, then you haven't found the edge of the deposit. And it's true in trading as well. If you're not having losing trades, you're not taking enough risk, right? So I've, I've kind of, because it's like my own money privately, I've been like really focused on high confidence results where it's like, look, we're going to spend this money and we think we know exactly what we're going to get before we do it. And that, for some reason, is comforting to me, but that misses out on this important point that Warwick's making, that you have to do some broader coverage. And he's right, and there's that's true across this one pit, and it's also true for the other pit. There's two pits that you got to look at, and 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 that's a challenge. So. The good news is he's real capable. This prospector is real capable in the field. He's got um, a small core drill. He's talked about being able to use that to make pilot holes where you then put in the expanding grout so you can do non-explosive rock blasting. It's a really useful way to break the rock. Um, and then he has a rock saw as well that's kind of like a chainsaw he said handheld which is essential equipment basically um, because all this program is going to be pretty nasty you know dusty work potentially right so having the equipment on hand is basically essential having somebody who knows how to use it safely is essential and trying to find contractors to do that work you know, from Ontario or BC or wherever, that's a nightmare right now. Not not only because of COVID having travel restrictions, but also because it's a bull market and every decent contractor is busier than they've been in the last five years. So you're stuck hiring people that you really don't want to hire, right? So that's why you want to work directly with these guys who have these projects and have the skills to do stuff with them. But then... You know, if you're going to work with them, you got to calibrate your expectations about what they can accomplish, you know, so that it's reasonable. And you can't expect them to do some comprehensive geological mapping program because not a geologist. But if you tell him, you know, <laughs> we want you to cut rock chips like out from here and here and here and there across this one, across that one, you know, and bag them up separately, carefully label them all, you know get them all on a pallet boom that's one round of work and then go back to this other spot where you have that high grade grab and put in your your grout and blast those you know and then muck that out and and then uh, blend that down into some composite but also have some separate buckets of each each different dome subdomain separate um, that is another round of work and then a third round, you know, drill some more you know, your tiny core holes below the place where you did your bulk sample, right? You start to understand what all those different things that he can do and, and then look at the project area you have and think about what's appropriate. And then you got to figure out budgets, you know, because his field work might be cheap, but the lab assaying costs probably start to get prohibitively expensive very quickly because I think generally most of these assays are going to have to be ICP which is like induced coupled plasma or something like that and it's you know they heat it to 6,000 degrees and it shoots off electrons and gives you some view on the elemental composition of the of the rocks which is really useful powerful information um, but even then, it's only elements, and it's not giving you minerals, and, and it's limited in that regard. Um, sometimes mineralogy is really important, like with nickel, if it's the right nickel mineral, it's okay, it's the wrong one, it's a big problem. 
So, you know, maybe you want to do mineralogy testing at the lab, right? But even then, you know, mineralogy isn't recoverability either. And that's what, you know, some other friends on Twitter um, have been kind of going at me and telling me about that. It's just like, hey, do some mineralogy work. Oh, sorry, do some do some recoverability, do some processing work. And that's why I talk about the scoping study again. So right now, that's the kind of one-two punch that I've settled on, which is like a broad geochem, first pass, comprehensive, you know, large <laughs> rock chip program with detailed evidence and documentation of sampling locations and then really concentrated rock sampling at the area where there's this high grade and doing scoping study work with that right so those are the kind of two streams of lab work that I want to get done. Um, and then you got to think about what you can do in the field that will allow those lab testing programs to be, you know, completed expeditiously. And it may well be that you're better off over sampling in the field and having this stockpile of sample material in some way that um, lives at site or lives in town and then you can come back to that if sometime in the winter something happens and you find oh boy this was really an exciting result where you want to come back to that one right so one good thing I'll mention is that um, the prospector said there's a construction crew paving the highway out there this fall. So there's potential for him to be able to get access to bulldozer, excavator, backhoe kind of heavy equipment um, for cheap. So rather than having to haul something out on a trailer, hundreds of kilometers middle of nowhere it'll already be out there and he'll be able to just rent it off them because it's not going to be getting used every day they're doing highway paving right and it'll be out there but it won't be getting used all the time so that's a really um useful thing to add to the mix and maybe it's a case of hey you know you put some money towards that and he does some more stripping this year with the bulldozer and pushes some more of the soil cover back to expand the known pit and push back on the edges and say okay where does this rock go right it's under a foot or five feet of dirt let's let's get that out of here so that we can see and then it'll be set up for us to come back here right away in the spring next year when we have more money to do more work here right that's an option um, the other thing is that the backhoe or, or the excavator may be really handy for moving the rocks after he's grout blasted them right so this non-explosive grout it kind of cracks the rocks in place but it doesn't blow them up it doesn't blast them out so they crack but they sit where they were and going from you know, a solid rock to a cracked rock is a good step, but it's still a cracked rock sitting there. So what do you do with that? And the answer is like, well, you probably have to, you know, either cut it down into smaller pieces. It's a lot of work with a handheld rock saw, or you got to get uh, an excavator with a bucket in there or something like that, right? And start um, digging the stuff out. Maybe you get an excavator with a jackhammer on it and you start really hammering that those those chunks into smaller pieces um and then you you know then you're bucketing you're digging out those smaller pieces right there's a whole question of workflow around that um that's really really important um and something i entirely trust this prospector to be able to do right 
And the other thing I trust him to be able to do is to say, there's more high grade at sight and I know where it is. He said that to me. So I have to take him at face value at this point, whether or not the grade runs across, you know, and how much of that material that he thinks is high grade, how much of it ends up being that. (laughs) Well, I'm not, I won't hold him to that, you know, but if he says this is the same kind of rock as that and that rock ran this, then I'll say, yep, okay, we'll take that chance because there's good reason to expect you'll get similar results, right? And so again, it's this question of how do you do that in a meaningful way on a limited budget? And the short answer is that you work with the prospector and you give him more funding than he's ever had, you know, to do the field work. And the longer answer is that he doesn't really need the funding for the field work. He can do the field work for a low cost, right? That's why he is who he is. That's his strength. So giving him a bunch of money for a bunch of field work, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem because the thing he hasn't been able to afford is the lab testing, right? His prospector grant predominantly goes to pay for lab fees. He pays his field costs out of pocket when he goes out. and and takes rock samples or or soil samples. He does all that just on his own. Oh, he's on a family vacation at the lake. Well, I'm going to go check out this brook and grab some soils and this and that and take them home, dry them out, and then send them off to the lab at some point when that money from the government comes through. That's how he approaches his business. So when he gets free money, the one thing he spends it on is lab work, generally. He doesn't buy a new hammer. He doesn't buy gas for his truck. That's, those are all costs that he just incurs as a routine order of operations just on his life, right? And that's how integrated all this prospecting exploration work is in his life. And it's really powerful. So that's why you want to team up with this guy is because it's, it's, he lives it. He really does. He really lives it. Um, And there are things that you could do that to buy for him that would, increase his productivity you know but to start with the biggest thing that he's that's gonna benefit him with money is gonna be paying for the lab costs because that's expensive right and so that's where the financiers and the capitalists come in because if you say okay got some money to apply to this situation let's do that and and then you find out Newfoundland is such a friendly place to do this. They have a rebate program where you'll get 50, 60, maybe up to 75% of the money that you spend as a company, up to 150 grand. You'll get that back. Cash. Like tax free or something. Like, what? How does that work? It's like, well, they want to support their minerals exploration business because they know. That if they find another Voises Bay, it's worth billions and billions and billions of dollars of tax revenue. And it impacts the quality of life of, you know, thousands of people over generations, right? So, you know, the impact, the positive, the potential positive impact, not all mines are good, right? But the potential for mines to be good in Canada um, and in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's really, it's really strong. Um, so that's what's at stake, right? So that's why the government's willing to pay out, you know, 50 grand here, 100 grand there. It's, it's peanuts in the long term compared with what it could generate if it, you know, gives them any slight edge over the competition in Quebec or Ontario or BC or Indonesia or wherever around the world, right? So that's at stake too. So when you're looking at this as a funding partner, you're saying, wow, I can potentially get three quarters of the money back. Like just before I even do anything with the project, that's very unusual, right? A lot of times you invest in these stocks, you're lucky if you can get 75% back just from, you know, a successful effort, let alone doing nothing. So 
the potential to do something with it is great too because this first round of work is really basic work it's really work that should have been done years ago there's one public company who had this and i dove into all the records they published on everything they did and all in all it looked a little goofy you know like they kind of rushed into drilling it felt like to me um they did a bit of geophysics and, and then they drilled a couple holes and it was kind of hard to see even where they drilled the holes because the maps were included in the news release they were on the company website but that link is long since dead right so you know and that company became a pot stock not long after right it dropped this project and changed over to be pot stock so they're not so serious maybe about exploration right they were kind of like oh it's hot cobalt numbers we'll call it a cobalt project and we'll say that we're a cobalt play and that was kind of the flavor of the month and when that faded out or proved more difficult than they might have expected you know they figured hey let's be a pot stock right because that's going to be favor of the month again uh, of course they were a bit late to that party and so you know the story goes on and they're chasing their tails and who knows they might catch it at some point but i don't really care you know i just look at what they did and i think wow you know they didn't do the most basic thing that you should do here which is to follow up on those first hot grabs and to do a more comprehensive program of surface grabs so that you have a layer a layer of data there that's useful and reliable to you know to any exploration geologist so you can show it to somebody and be like look this is what it looks like and be like, oh yeah yeah show me the other elements yeah okay and you know show me the factors show me the nickel cobalt factor oh yeah and show me the copper cobalt factor oh yeah what about this what about that you know there's all this data analysis that goes along with this stuff and that's the reason you take this scientific approach is because the business of exploration is a pretty scientific business really there's a lot of chance and room for cowboys to do things in it but the community that says whether any one exploration success, uh, sorry, one effort is successful or not, it's a really scientific community in a lot of ways. So you have to understand that and you have to cater to that community by doing your work in a scientific way. Um, or at least give the appearance of doing your work in a scientific way and that public company who had this project basically didn't do that at all in, in my opinion again they kind of rushed to drilling and, and then they ended up killing it which is unfortunate for them but good for me at this point point. and I say it's good for me because there's this obvious and important work that was left undone so that's great but then it becomes this big challenge of what exactly does that work look like and that's the thing that I'm kind of grappling over, and I've talked a bit about it already. Um, it's a little hard to describe without, you know, some visual aids and some detailed maps. That's one of the things that I'm going to work on preparing here next is, like, images of, you know, what is the search space? What kind of grids could we do here and there? Um, you know, and it's tough because I can go on Google Earth and say, oh, you should do this and this. But it's not that way when you're at site. You know, and you want to have this rigorous plan, but you also want to embrace some of the, you know, wild spirit of the prospector and let him kind of follow his nose. So, you know, figuring out what that program's going to look like is hard, and it's not something I've ever done before. Um, and yeah, there's this big unknown, too, around the lab costs. So I'm at a point today where I don't know the lab costs. I've had some back and forth with different people on what range of possibilities we could get for lab work. And I'm starting to get comfortable with that. But I don't know what the costs are for those things. So before I really get a sense of what the constraints are and what the plans, you know, what a series of different plans could look like, I got to figure out what those costs are, right? So that's up next for me here. Um, and after I get a sense for those costs, then it'll be a case of going back to the field work and thinking about what different types of approach on the field work generate, what different types of samples 
and what types of samples um, lead into what types of assay and lab testing, right? So it's a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of connected, and I'm at the early days of figuring it all out, but this note here has been kind of explanation. So I'll call it there. Thanks.